Okay, so we just wrapped up the traditional data sets where we looked at passive DNS, uh, who is information, hashes, and a couple of other uh, available resources to us. And really what uh, I think is a great example here is this news.googlesolveservice.net for really highlighting the value of those data sets. The traditional data sets. The traditional data sets, correct. Yeah. Um, so just looking at those and, and isolating our investigation to just using something like passive DNS and who is to really form all the connections that we can. So I think this is a really interesting example here where when we run the search, we can see that the infrastructure still appears to be active. Um, it's only been around for well, about a year now. Um, and we have some information available to us. Right away, uh, what strikes me as interesting is that there's a number of different Korean uh, addresses, IP addresses that are here in passive DNS. Um, and actually a, a nice example here of a non-routable address too, that 127.001. Mm -hmm. I mentioned previously that sometimes actors will go and turn off their command and control when they're finished uh, running their operations as a means to not draw attention. Uh, when in reality, that, that signaling that they're doing is, is actually drawing attention to, to me as an analyst. So that 127.001 instantly uh, gets me interested because it makes me feel like this might be a, a malicious actor. Mm -hmm. So if we were to pivot, let's say, on uh, one of these uh, Korean IP addresses, let's say the first one, uh, that 115, uh, 144, 238, 49, we can then see that we have some more infrastructure that's not necessarily as active. Uh, you know, in the past uh, month or so, it's dropped off in activity. But again, you know, looking off that pivot of IP addresses and passive DNS, we now have three different domains that we can go with. So keeping in mind that we started with GoogleSolveService.net, we now have GoogleBuilder.net, GoogleCustomService.com, and GoogleBills.net. So we just went from one connection point, a couple of different IPs to some other Google sort of themed domains that we can go off of here. Now, for me, there's a number of different avenues that we could go down. And one of the complications that infrastructure like this introduces is you got to pull a whole bunch of threads. Right. And so we have to focus our search here. And I'm going to, you know, in reality, what I would typically do is explore each one of these um, and follow it all the way down to its conclusion. You get a dead end and then you have to go back up to the top yeah. and go, go back. You know, for, for the sake of the example here and what it is that we're walking through, we're just going to go through the infrastructure in a very linear way and just, uh, you know, talk through each of the steps. And then we'll, um, we'll kind of wrap up with all the connections that we've made. So we have this game.googlecustomservice.com. If we go and pivot on that, um, what we're going to see here is, again, some lengthier history. So this appears to be an older domain. Uh, we see the, it's all 127. Yeah, the inclusion of our 127.001, a tactic, again, leveraged by actors in some cases. Um, I can't quite remember if the IP address is different, but we do have a common theme here of uh, Korean IP addresses showing up. Mm -hmm. But for me, instead of focusing in on the passive DNS side, I want to take a look at the who is information. And so right off the bat, from an analyst perspective, I get a number of unique things in the side of this who is record. I got two email addresses that appear highly unique. The names themselves even appear pretty unique as well. Um, and so does the organization. And so from an analyst perspective, I could go down any number of these leads, but I want to focus in on the phone numbers. We have three different phone numbers here one uh, distinct one for each section of the who is record. If I pivot on one of those who is, uh, one of those um, phone numbers, what I'm going to get is another lead here. And so I pivoted on one of the uh, phone numbers as part of that record and we see our original Google Solveservice.net was associated with that phone number. but now we have the inclusion of another domain one Apple AppWords.net and another email address. another email that we could go and explore. So if we go and take a look at that Apple AppWords.net. It's a 127. All right, so we got a 127.001. So from a passive DNS it's, perspective. It's always been at 127. Yeah, that's that's not going to help us too much. Yeah. Uh, it's been there, in fact, for, for a number of years. Like it's, uh, it's not even clear what this particular infrastructure is associated to. If we look at the who is information, um, there's a lot of, again, uh, unique information we could go off of here and we could continue to pivot. However, I want to explore some of the subdomains. And so looking at the subdomains, we got app, which is pretty common. We got FTP, that's pretty common, dub, dub, dub. The one that sticks out to me is this LED1. LED1 is interesting simply because it doesn't appear like a common subdomain. Uh, I don't know why they would go with it. Um, and in fact, in some of our previous uh, pivots, we noticed that there was a LED in one of the other subdomains as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's a pattern here. 
So if we go and pivot on that led1.appleadwords.net, we now end up in a case where uh, we already know that the subdomains is exhausted. We know that who is is an avenue that we could go down. But if you remember, appleadwords.net, the domain itself, was resolving to 127.001, dead avenue. Keeping in mind, subdomains, every single one of those it's gives us an different. avenue of research. And so this led one is not resolving to 127.001. It actually has a live IP address, one that we have not seen before. And that, to me, makes it particularly interesting. So if we pivot on that 98, 126, 218, 141, not only do we have our led1.appleadwords.net overlap, so we're kind of seeing some tech company overlap here, but now we have a led1.igooglefiles.com. Again, keeping with the, uh, with the pattern here of tech companies referencing Google, led1, uh, some overlap in infrastructure, this to me is, is getting more interesting. And so at this point, I can pivot on this led1.igooglefiles.com uh, and I, again, have the same IP address, so not much of an avenue there. Um, we can look at the who is information. Yet again, we have some more, uh, you know, that star appearing, star street appearing uh, as the street. And a different email address as well. Another email address, another fairly unique looking uh, name, Jack Jack. Um, and again, some phone numbers here that we can pivot down. But... You know, I could continue to go down this route. Again, a lot of avenues here, but to me what's intriguing is these 19 subdomains. Again, individual points that I could go down that could lead to other infrastructure. And what I'm seeing here is a lot of interesting subdomains that appear to be not necessarily emulating services, but are maybe emulating countries. So we have uh, HK, UK, KR, KS. Uh, we have our LED1 showing up again. We have this Firefox updata.com.igooglefiles.com. Mm -hmm. Even at this point, if I knew that this infrastructure wasn't malicious, that subdomain is so weird. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it doesn't fit a pattern that, that I'm used to seeing. Uh, and that to me is, uh, is of particular interest. And so uh, if we go and explore a little bit further here off of some of these, uh, you know, going back to some of the infrastructure that we had previously on this game.googlecustomservice.com, we can go and explore uh, some of the other passive DNS that we saw, particular in particular that 180.150 address. And so going here, um, we can see a couple other pieces of overlap to infrastructure. Uh, maybe uh, this this could be yeah, maybe a, a, a typo squad of some sort. It's not entirely clear to me. Um, you know that we can continue to run down. Now you may have noticed that as we were pivoting through this infrastructure, um, oftentimes there was a project that was populated. Uh, that was uh, potentially available to us that we did not necessarily explore. Uh, and the reason why I didn't explore that right away is because I didn't want to short circuit the investigation right when we started. Um, but for anyone who was paying attention, you would have noticed that there was a project associated with most of this uh, infrastructure. And the particular project that I'm interested in is this Lead Casper uh, published out by Silence. And so if I click on this project, what I'm going to get is 125 artifacts and indicators that go back to this espionage group that uh, is targeting all these industrial companies. And what's particular to note here is that these actors use the presence of lead in the subdomains when they're setting up infrastructure, a pattern that they sort of give away. And what's interesting is if you actually read this narrative, the blog that's been put out by Microsoft, they shed a lot more details about the actors themselves, who's conducting the operations, and what's great is that Silence has already put together a pretty extensive project that we can use as a foundation for our exploration. And, and even the project history is, is wonderful to go through and examine exactly how this was built over time. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And so there's a lot of threads that we could pull in this infrastructure, and it, it, it almost seemingly appears endless. I mean, there's literally, uh, you know, tens of email addresses and phone numbers and names and streets and domains and who is and everything else that really makes up the infrastructure itself. And so with, uh, using a, a system called Multigo, which is a, a graph visualization tool, uh, what we saw in that example for Google uh, soft service, uh, .net was that it was really complicated. There was a lot of avenues that we could go down and explore um, and a lot of potential for overlap. So using Multigo and the free transforms that are available from Risk IQ Community Edition and Passive Total, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually map out this in a more visual friendly format. And so what we did here uh, was 
we are essentially focusing in on the right hand side of the graph, um, whereas the left hand side was older infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what you can see in the graph, even though you can't necessarily read the values, the, the blue circles represent domains, the little orange uh, card looking icon represents an IP address, and then the black circle represents some who is information. Right, like telephone number, email address. Yeah, and so with this infrastructure, um, what was particularly interesting is that the actors themselves were using uh, newer infrastructure. They were continuing to conduct their operations uh, but there's that one key piece in the center of our graph there that links the left side to the right side. And it's a single IP address where the actors mistakenly have pointed and overlapped their infrastructure. And we were able to find and track all of the activity back to them. So a very cool example, leveraging the traditional data sets that's still relevant today.